And I have the big honor, privilege to be talking with my co-pilot in all things Latinx pop culture, Christopher Gonzalez over at the uh, Utah State. Logan, uh, welcome Christopher and also editor of a special issue on Robert Rodriguez and we've done a bunch of books together but I'm so happy to be here talking to you about Desperado. Yeah, man, thank you for the invite. Um, uh, as you said, you and I uh, have collaborated in a lot of different ways, both formally and informally, right? Just conversations we've had. And I think we thought this would be a really cool opportunity on this occasion for us to kind of um, talk about, uh, in particular, Desperado, but uh, Rodriguez in um, kind of in general. So, Chris, you know, right out of the gate, 25 years, Desperado, um, was released huge for all of us. Do you remember that day? Or yeah, that I actually, time? yeah, yeah, I actually do. I remember. Um, I was uh, I was an undergraduate at Stan Houston State in Texas, and um, you know, I I was I was um, someone who was already really uh, aware, keenly aware of Quentin Tarantino, and um, and there was something about the film that seemed to echo the kind of stylings of Tarantino, but it was something new as well. And I can remember sitting in that theater for the first time, just like, um, uh, like blown away with that opening sequence, right? Um, which I know we're going to talk more about the film, but um, I, I just remember sitting there going, this is something I've never seen before. This is something different. And like someone has arrived like an atom bomb, right? Um, and like it cannot be ignored, right? It's kind of um, earthquake. Uh, so yeah, I I definitely remember. And what was interesting is, I, I immediately um, you know th this was the days where you know you, you you had to wait or you had to go to the you know uh, movie theater uh, over and over again to watch it. I remember buying the soundtrack and just listening to it over and over again. And and what it had were were these little interludes that were dialogue from the film. And it was it was just like that was what I had to tide me over until I could get my hands on a copy. Uh, to watch over and over, but yeah, it that film became kind of a uh, almost a touchstone for me. Like I, I just watched it over and over again. And as a younger person, I just thought, well, this is cool. But it wasn't until you know, you know, deeper thinking and the kind of work that you and I do, where I really appreciated what Rodriguez and what the film is actually doing. Speaking of the soundtrack, uh, man, like Chicano rock, we got them all, man. Uh, Ro Robert Rodriguez just put together this awesome, like, sound score, right, for the movie? Yeah, um, which, of course, you know, later on, um, I found out, and through a lot of your work uh, on his films and his process, that he's just, he's, he's so hands-on on every aspect of the films that he makes. And the and the and the and the music is no different, right? Like like that is a shaping aspect of the narrative that, that he's telling on screen. But but it was interesting because you know growing up, I was I was used to you know Latino music um, uh, not not being rock, <laughs> right? Uh, it was it was a ranchera or it was some kind of corrido, right? And so to hear that kind of uh, interesting interplay of kind of mariachi sounds, but also, you know, rock and this kind of like, you know, shredding of the electric guitar uh, was really uh, mind blowing. Yeah, I love it too, man. It's just like crazy. You know, honestly, um, looking back and rewatching it again um, in celebration of the 25 years, it's honestly, I have to say, like, almost a perfect movie you know it's like great storytelling great action and you know excellent casting the whole thing let me I'm, i want to like throw around this you know for us to chew on a little bit like how how is it that the united states media right now is not celebrating robert rodriguez it takes like turkish world news to like put a spotlight on the guy i guarantee you you know, 1994 Pulp Fiction, 25 years on, we definitely got a media storm around that. And we're just not getting it around, you know, Robert's work. I mean, you know, is this business as usual? Like, here we are, Latinx is doing all this crazy good stuff, and we're just still that invisible? 
Yeah, it's it's really uh, kind of hard to put your finger on, you know, uh, other than what seems to be obvious reasons, um, you know, uh, because the because that film that we're talking about, Desperado, uh, uh, you know, it re really puts him on the map of kind of the giants of the time, right? Um, you know, Tarantino was already being heralded as this kind of wunderkind, right? It kind of came from like independent film, and now he was kind of he was kind of the director du jour. And it's interesting that they have this partnership already, this, this kind of friendship. Um, I don't know why there isn't more buzz about um, uh, Desperado's uh, anniversary. Um, I would think that the state of Texas would be all over this. Uh, he's, he's kind of, you know, he's one of their sons. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I haven't seen it. I haven't, I haven't seen any media uh, pieces uh, maybe they are locally, but I, they haven't crossed my transom yet. I don't know about you, but it, but but to, but the fact that you are being called to speak about this film um, from a, from a media outlet in Istanbul, <laughs> right, is like it, you know it, it, you know the United States should be embarrassed, you know, that, that it's not recognizing a great talent uh, in its own midst and it's not celebrating that. Yeah, I mean, it kind of gets back to one of, you know, our points. Um, I think we both talk about this, but, you know, how, like, finally, he made the right decision just to make a cut from, like, mainstream Hollywood, right? Um, the difficulties on Desperado kind of breathing down his neck, the producers, um, the, even, like, the title of the movie, right? Um, that's something that he didn't want. He wanted Pistolero. They put Desperado... So, right, imposing a kind of gringo-fied um, Spanish kind of throw in like an O at the end. Um, but, you know, yeah, it's like, no wonder the guy said, I don't want anything to do with you guys, right? Yeah, um, and, and I think it's, well, one, it's, it's, it's very, um, you know, illuminating that, um, that he did that. Uh, he made that choice and succeeded, we should say. And yet, um, in a lot of ways, he's, uh, he's a rare kind of person because um, whether it was, um, you know, serendipity, you know, just his own talents, uh, being in the right place at the right time, he was able to do that. I think a lot of other Latinx directors aren't able to do that. And so they're, they're really shackled to the kind of the Hollywood system and when the Hollywood system says, and the executives say, well, that's not the kind of film that we're looking for, or could you do more of this and less of that? Um, you know, many filmmakers and storytellers just aren't able to say, well, I'm just gonna go back where I'm comfortable and create my own, you know, studio and my own um, kind of venue for creating these opportunities, just kind of forgetting mm. The power and might of um, Hollywood, but I and and I also wonder if that has something to do with why he's not being celebrated, right? Because mm -hmm. if he's a Hollywood darling, then you mm -hmm. have the Hollywood press kind of like um, juggernaut that can put out pieces celebrating him, uh, mm -hmm. but they can also be quiet, right? And so if they're not saying much about him, then that's kind of uh, that's a message to other like journalistic uh, outlets to not shine light on him because he got away with it right he kind of like you know stuck his thumb in the eye of hollywood and he and he thrived mm -hmm. um so yeah it is it is interesting that you know even the even at the level of the title of the of the film which to me was reminiscent of like the of the the the, the eagle song desperado right which was this mm -hmm. weird romanticization of like the loner drifter, maybe Latino in the in the Southwest, um, mm -hmm. uh, who's kind of desperate and on the run. Um, I don't know if that's what they were thinking of in terms of that of, of that of that film or why they wanted to use that title. If mm -hmm. there was a kind of familiarity with that word, as opposed yeah. to what Bolero, right? Which I, I I still think that even if you don't speak Spanish, you can kind of get the gist of what Pistolero is, right? Um, but anyway, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think that um, he was, um, he was in many ways very um, uh, fortunate and, and wise mm -hmm. in getting out of that system and blazing his own trail.
Yeah, you know, and it is amazing. You know, you were talking about your going to the movies. Me too. It was like mind blowing for me. And part of it was that, you know, earlier that summer, or just before the summer, I remember seeing Mi Familia, which, you know, I loved. It's, you know, Gregory Nava, beautiful, um, kind of, but still very sort of, you know, serving a purpose, very sentimental, you know, that sepia kind of wash. Um, but humanizing all these different kind of aspects of our community or as much as it could. And then bam, we get this like superhero action movie, just mind blowing. Right. Um, and so different to all the other things that, you know, we had been used to, um, at least, you know, for us in college kind of, you know, young, young adults going, uh, mi vida loca. Right. So, and then American me, uh, um, blood, blood out. Blood in, blood out, right? Um, and so, like, always, like, tr like, an issue, like somehow, right? The Latinx as having some kind of cross to bear issue burden, and then here we just like, we just have like an action superhero who's like, who's com who's complex, but doesn't have like you know lots of baggage to carry around. Yeah, it's, 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 you know, what that makes me think of is how um, the films that we listed, like, um, uh, you know, Blood In, Blood Out and, and some of the others are, are ostensibly gr grounded in a kind of hyper-realism, right? Like, this is the real barrio. This is what it's really like. And Desperado, like, like isn't shackled by that. Like, there, there are fantastical elements in Desperado, right, where these kind of like, um, kind of moments of just like a blurring of is this a is this a potentially real place or is it almost like a mythical place, which Rodriguez would then kind of further explore in From Dust Till Dawn, right, more explicitly. Mm -hmm. But but I think there are, there are elements there of like he can be like a superhero type. He can like do extraordinary things. Um, and, you know, and it's, and it's like, it's not the tried and true, uh, um, uh, magical realism, right? That's mm -hmm. not what we're talking about. It's just a kind of like, and I think you, you've probably, you know, been the best at talking about this. It's, it's almost like a kind of comic book realism, right? Like, like you were talking about this as like a superhero. There, there are like comic book elements to the film that um mm. that i think raised this film uh, in, into a different plane than some of the other films we were talking about before yeah you know chris um before we get into some of the details of the film um you write a lot about permissible narratives um especially in uh latino literature and fiction and the history of that um how how would you kind of take your approach to something like desperado yeah, I, I, I think that in that case, you can see Rodriguez is clearly wanting to take his vision for his story into a different area that, that clearly made studio execs uncomfortable. And while he compromised on certain areas, it still is ultimately a film that is much more in the realm of a Quentin Tarantino type of execution rather than um, something that Edward James almost would, would have done uh, or, you know, some of these stories that Gregory Nava and Taylor Hackford, right? So it's like, he's already, like, pushing into new territory, and it was clearly going to be untenable. He was not going to continue to make the kind of films that he really wanted to make if he was constrained by what Hollywood thought was permissible, right? So, so this, is, um, this is a film that's interesting because it, it's, he, he, is, he is still constrained I think by the by by Hollywood in some aspects, like we have the clear um, you know love interest in there. Well, that's usually something that Hollywood wants to put in there, and maybe it plays out in a way that he wouldn't have probably done it had he been independent, um, you know, truly independent at that point. But there's no doubt that um, he parlayed that success of that film into like like we were saying before. Now, kind of cutting ties and, and now really being able to do the kinds of things that, that, that he's interested in and less, uh, less of the films that might be recognized by Hollywood. And I think it's no, uh, it's no accident that, you know, Tarantino seems to be kind of still, despite some of the, 
very kind of disturbing things that we hear, you know, with his connections to, to Harvey Weinstein and some of the other things that, that, that we've heard, um, he still is like a darling of, of like Hollywood. Like he's like, he is nominated often for the Oscar has won several times. And uh, Rodriguez still, you know, is kind of Texas based doing the kinds of things that he's interested in that I think Hollywood um, is less interested in or less willing to say, this is something that we approve of. Yeah, it's, um, you know, I, I love what you had to say there, Chris. It got me thinking about how in El Mariachi and then in Desperado, you still have a kind of sense of a container in terms of genre, but then he's smuggling stuff in t right to the audiences um, and growing and building his audience, just as he's growing and building his Latinx star system and then eventually growing and building his own kind of corpus of different kinds of storytelling. Um, but the more and more you look at it, um, as time passes, the less he's sort of smuggling and the more he's just doing, right? He's just like, um, you know, a planet terror, right? It's like, um, I'm gonna kind of throw a bunch of stuff in here and then I'm gonna end this with, you know, Rose McGowan as the kind of leader of the new tribe that's a, you know, kind of totally mixed race and she's the warrior leader, you know? Um, yeah, no, I get what you're saying. Yeah, for sure. Um, what's what? What's your sort of, if I were to ask you, what's your favorite part in the movie? Um, you know, uh, I, I, I have so many uh, just scenes and parts of the film that really resonate. Um, one is that, you know, many times in the film, Rodriguez takes a kind of like what would be, um, you know, either unexpected or especially for someone who's like first big you know, kind of studio film, uh, I'm sure he got pushed back on, which is there are several sequences where a character is just telling a story. Uh, so, so the opening, there's, there's uh, Steve Buscemi kind of like belly up to the bar and he just starts telling a story and we get these little like fantasized, you know, you know snippets of, of this character, this mariachi who's coming in for vengeance. And it works, like it's just, a, it's just a guy telling a story. And then later on, there's the little bit with Tarantino who's doing his little bit with the joke. And it's just him at the bar like telling a joke. And it, and it works to balance some of those um, moments where, where we have um, Danny Trejo, right? In his, in his kind of like blockbuster kind of like debut here with nary a word like he doesn't say one word all he's doing is like throwing knives uh, and like that's just an interesting balance between the real fast talking Buscemi and Tarantino moments to these moments of like like this character doesn't even talk and then there's there's the character who, who's like the young kid who's kind of rising in the ranks uh, being part of Bucho's crew he doesn't talk either, right? So you have these interesting characters that are, are, are balanced. And so like that's one aspect of the film that I really appreciate it. I also really appreciated its use of sound and music, um, which is just really kind of like sensorial, right? It just like kind of blows you away and it immerses you in that world. Um, and then of course, just the humor. Like, like, like it, it could have been a very dark film where this guy's out for justice, right? He's just, he's going to get revenge. But there's just these moments of levity. There's the moment where, you know, he shot up and, um, you know, some highest character is, you know, stitching him up and like kind of just like putting him through, you know, pain, but she's like helping him out. And those are just really funny, humorous moments. Um, uh, and then... I also think, uh, you know, the character of Bucho is this, is this really interesting dynamic character um, that we get to see a lot of. He speaks a lot, he talks a lot, he's, he's clearly volatile, but in many ways he steals every scene that he's in. Yeah, no, that's great. I was thinking as you were talking about like the skillful use of sound design to kind of, you know, trigger and heighten emotion, um, investment and impact. Um, the camera too, and this speaks to kind of our discussion in other places about the kind of comic book worldview, but um, looking at it again, I forgot how kind of determined how much intentionality there is in like the shots themselves. So not just kind of like, you know, the stuff that we expect with a kind of close up of banderas, you know, and like the, the full range of expression, but the shot like, you know, three seconds on a boot 
you know, and like, well, what do comic books do? Like the panel and the page ask us also to kind of take pause over an, the image and think about it a second. And I mean, in Hollywood studio filmmaking, that kind of moment in a narrative is unheard of. Like you just, you just don't do it unless it's a smoking gun, right? Right, exactly. And I mean, I know you know this and many of many of the people who are going to be, you know, uh, partaking in our conversation here probably know this, but, you know, Robert Rodriguez is very much a comic book, you know, minded person, you know, he's, he's, he's created comics, he, he, he knows the form very well. And I think he uses that, that the, the traditions of, of comic book storytelling to great effect, in particular in, in this film. And, you know, we were talking about Danny Trejo's character. I mean, that whole sequence where he first encounters Banderas and he's just like constantly throwing knives at him, it's very, like, you can just see that as like a sequence in a comic book where there's, there is no dialogue. It's just, it's just pure action. Um, and we have those moments throughout the film where, where the can as you said, the camera uh, and the sequencing are almost counterintuitive to what you would expect a film to do. Yeah, no, totally. That's one of the kind of wonderful things about it, going back, the kind of texture and rhythm that Robert isn't afraid to bring into that storytelling space, right? Um, yeah, you know, for me, it also one of the big kind of highlights, um, not only the the acting, which I think I just, you know, I just love it. And of course, um, you know, I talked about this with that Turkish news folks, but like how Banderas and Hayek really humanize in their capacity to act this full range of complex emotions on their face and everything. Um, but but also the El Mariachi's relationship with the little boy, I think, is really significant, right? Um, and I love that relationship. And it's not another one of those where absent father, surrogate dad, that kind of stuff. It's it's it doesn't go down that road. In fact, the father appears there at the end, kind of taking making sure his son's okay in the hospital, right? Um, so yeah, this kind of this really gentle relationship between, you know, um, uh, an older sort of role model male and a younger Latino in a film, I think maybe for the first time, again, without any real issues being kind of forced on us, right? Yeah, I mean, that makes me think of the scene, and we see it several times, right, with the little boy who is, you know, he's playing his guitar, and is he is he going to be kind of, and he is like kind of brought into this world of crime. Um, there are those moments where, oh, there's that one scene in particular where, um, you know, El Mariachi is, you know, he like sidles up next to the boy and the boy is like struggling to play the guitar and he says, well, like do this, right? And he, and he gives him the, this kind of mentoring, like on the fly. Um, and, and it is, is a very tender moment. Um, you know, that's, that, that is not accidental. That is, that is someone who understands pacing of storytelling. That is someone who understands what it means to be a Latino male in popular culture and the imagination of the United States, which is like where drug dealers, and there are drug dealers and bad people in this film, but there's that moment where he takes a moment to say, do this, like this little exercise with your guitar every day, practice all the time, and that's how you get better, right? It's like, you know, it, it's, it's, again, it's one of those scenes that gives a complexity to El Mariachi as a character. Um, and those are the moments that kind of remind me of um, the tradition of Sergio Leone, right? And the kind of, you know, man with no name kind of uh, films with, with, with Eastwood. Right, where you don't really know a lot about this guy, but you know he's a badass, you know he's good with a gun, and but yet he's human. Like there are these moments where he's still like on the side of good in the sense that he's an ethical person as or as much as he can be. And I think that moment of the mentoring of that little boy is kind of a hearkening to the kinds of things that Leone would do in his films where he would take his you know, quiet, no-named protagonist and, and, and just do a little something that reminds the audience that this is a good guy, like, at heart, but he's put, been put 
by force, he's been put into a situation where he has to be like this badass. Yeah, totally. And, you know, it's interesting because, you know, people um, these days talk about toxic masculinity and it kind of being represented uncritically, you know, in all of the kind of imagery that we absorb or that we're kind of um, bombarded with. And, you know, looking back at El Mariachi, you know, um, there's nothing aggressive about him. There's nothing threatening. There's, you know, everything about El Mariachi is about kind of, um, you know, saving the community, um, you know, and there's just a softness about him. Yeah, I mean, there's that there's that moment where he he, he becomes very um, like pensive. He's like really thinking. Um, and he's kind of almost philosophizing, right? And he says, you know, it's easier to destroy than to create, you know? And, you know, he's a musician by trade. This is what he did. This, is, this was his career, right? This is, you know, it was like bringing joy to people, bringing music to people. Um, and we talked about music in the film, right? It is, it is a very powerful force. And I think it echoes that uh, for the audience that, you know, such, such great music. And then here's a character who really is a musician at heart. Uh, is a creative type, right? And how often do we see that in Latinx male representation in films, where someone's creating and someone's trying to, you know, bring something good into the world? And again, be, through really, you know, circumstances have kind of put him into this situation where he has to now become this guy, but he didn't start out that way. And I think, you know, evidence of that is the is the distance we have from um you know steve buscemi's rendering of him right when he at the beginning of the film where he's like you know the biggest mexican you've ever seen and he was doing this he's like a larger than life kind of you know kind of badass right and but the real mariachi is like a human he's like a, he's just a guy who has been you know kind of forced into that situation so mm -hmm. i mean i i maybe at the time when i saw it i i didn't get it but now, you know, in, in the kinds of conversations we have like this, like, it's really easy to see that, you know, Rodriguez has this on his mind as not being the kind of cardboard cutout action hero, uh, at, you know, now as a Latino. Like, this is a complex, you know, sensitive Latino male. And uh, that in itself is groundbreaking. Yeah, big cha big contrast uh, to um, El Chicano, right? That came out, um, what was it, a year ago? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, where like somehow our superhero um, has to be anchored in a, a community that's ripped apart, that comes with all of this sort of psychological trauma and baggage and, you know, um, huge difference, right? Um, yeah, it just kind of proves, goes to show us that just because we've kind of moved forward in time, 25 years, it doesn't necessarily mean that representation has gotten better, right? Um, so yeah. these fits and starts where we get, you know, like really great things and then it kind of goes back to business as usual. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, it's really important to always, when we talk about representation, is, you know, it it's not an improvement to have more bad representation, right? Like, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about, in terms of representation, we're talking about how can we have diverse uh, kind of iterations of Latinx culture on the screen, right? And so, um, a, you know, a film like, you know, El Chicano, right, is, is, um, is playing right into the tradition of stereotypes. Whereas Desperado is aware of those stereotypes, but is deliberately playing against them. Uh, and which is, which is why it's smarter, which is why the film has stood the test of time and will continue to be talked about. Yeah, absolutely. As we kind of wind this down, Chris, I want to um, just kind of put our focus a little bit on the ending. Our colleague, uh, Jim Donahue, uh, wrote a really nice chapter about this in the collection that I um, edited. Um, and I know your special issue also had some really nice pieces on, um, on the Mexico trilogy. And, um, but the idea that, in fact, 
it isn't a loner. He's not alone. In fact, as the story unfolds, he becomes more and more a part of a, a family, an ad hoc family, if you will. And I love that, you know, as it kind of wraps up, yes, there's the showdown with the brother, um, but at the same time, there's a kind of a willful selection of kind of the Latino family that you want to have that's transformative, that's empowering, that's positive. And in the end, it's the Latina who's kind of controlling the narrative. She's the one driving up down the road and she's the one who stops and picks them up and they drive off. Um, yeah, what, what's, what was your feeling and sense of the ending with all of this sort of in the air? I mean, I think again, it's, it, it takes me to a different place, right? It takes me to a different area that I'm not used to uh, when I see Latinos on screen, or at least up to that point. And as you mentioned, even after, right? Um, that, that, you know, in a lot of similarly kind of structured films, and I'm thinking of like Leone again, you have that loner figure who kind of goes off alone again. Like he's, he's destined or doomed to always roam the earth by himself, right? And he's, and he's constantly just kind of making his own way. Um, you know, he can't end up with someone that he's, that, that, that he, I guess, loves or is t coming to love. Um, and we certainly don't see like a strong Latina, you know, woman who is like, like as you said, is kind of, you know, the driving force there at the end. Um, it's just very impressive to me, right? It's like, he, he has, to, like, he's not calling the shots at that moment. Like, he's literally like hitching a ride, like wherever he can go. And she's the one that stops and he has to make the decision, do I, do I get in and perhaps make a life with her? Who knows where this will go, but at least take that step or do I, do I continue to just remain tortured and alone? Right. And, and I, I just feel like the, the tradition of film and with those kind of characters is that he's going to remain alone. And so again, I think it's Rodriguez taking us to a different spot where he has his protagonist get in and he tosses like the guitar case, right? It's like, that's very powerful. And, you know, it goes against the toxic masculinity kind of figure of, you know, I have to have my guns. I'm not secure. I don't want to, you know, be vulnerable. Right. Well, often when we see these figures, they don't want to get into a relationship because that is then a potential weak spot that people can then use against them. So, so you have to be very vulnerable to be able to say, I'm, I'm going to enter into this relationship with you. And I'm kind of like leaving this part of my life, you know, you know, kind of to the, literally by the by the wayside of the road. Um, I, I think it's just phenomenal ending, um, uh, you know, just a kind of ending that, that, that we haven't seen a lot before and certainly even after. Yeah, no, it's amazing. Um, well, Christopher Gonzalez, thank you for spending a little time with me and um, kind of, you know, drilling in, dialing into this discussion of Desperado 25 years. Awesome. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, wonderful memories, wonderful conversation. I always appreciate the opportunity, Frederick. Thank you. Thank you.